When people describe the start of the Second World War, it usually goes one of three ways. Hitler the madman invaded Poland for no reason, the same way he had just invaded Austria and Czechoslovakia for no apparent reason. Evil Hitler invaded Poland to begin the enslavement and extermination of the Slavs because he said they were inferior in Mein Kampf. And then there's your average person who's gobbled up all the post-war allied and Soviet propaganda, who's never looked into the war, who genuinely believes that Hitler was trying to take over the world. Surely no one could lie like that to people, right? Oh my god, bro. I've seen this last opinion all over the YouTube comment section. It might even be the most prevalent opinion. Well, here's what really happened. First, a summary of how we got here. I go into far more depth in my last video. Germany, after events not entirely of their own making, had taken advantage and become at one with Austria, brought the Sudeten Germans back into the fold, and no one really minded. British Prime Minister Chamberlain was happy to work with Hitler to right the wrongs of Versailles via peaceful means. Hitler betrayed Chamberlain's trust, however, by opportunistically seizing Czechoslovakia when the state began to collapse. In his words, to restore order. But to the rest of the world, this looked, and was, unprovoked aggression. After this, conspiracy theories went wild. The Romanian minister in London, for reasons unknown, said he had sources that Germany was about to invade Romania immediately, even though there was not even a common border between the two nations. This was a total fiction, but for some reason, the British government believed him. The British opposition to appeasement grew, and the warmongers like Churchill, who were being paid by shadowy figures in the city of London to oppose Hitler, gained influence. Just before this, Germany's negotiations with Poland over the return of Danzig, a German city, broke down. To make matters worse, Ian Colvin, a British news correspondent with excellent sources in Berlin, came to London reporting on an imminent German invasion of Poland. Like the Romanian war scare, this was false, but again, like before, the British government chose to believe Colvin. Immediately after the meeting with Colvin, the British government decided there and then that Poland must be given a guarantee. Four days later, an astonished Colonel Beck, Poland's foreign minister, received the British ambassador, who asked if he would accept a full guarantee of Polish independence in the event of a German invasion. Beck obviously accepted. He couldn't believe what had just happened. Four days before the British meeting with Colvin, Hitler had issued a directive to his army commander-in-chief. It read, Führer does not wish to solve the Danzig question by force. He does not wish to drive Poland into the arms of Britain by doing this. Hitler never wanted war with Poland. He wanted an alliance with Poland. They weren't so different, after all. A quick history of Poland since its latest independence after the First World War. Almost as soon as Poland regained its independence after 123 years, it was almost immediately in a war of their own doing. There was a split idea of what the new Polish state should be. Should it be a Polish national state, only encompassing Polish or Polonizable territories, as Roman Domowski wished? or a large Polish-led federation of semi-independent states, as Pilsudski wished. This latter idea wasn't exactly an attempt to recreate the borders of the Polish-Lithuanian Empire of before, but it certainly came close. The Polish interwar period probably warrants its own video on a more specific Polish history channel. It was a very confusing time. But in summary, Poland tried to strangle the newly formed Soviet Union in its crib by invading whilst the Russian Civil War was underway. The Poles' goal was Ukraine. They were beaten back to Warsaw, but at what history now calls the Miracle on the Vistula, they pushed the Soviets back and eventually won the war. At the Treaty of Riga, Poland now became a kind of empire. Poland was now filled with millions of Ukrainians, Belarusians, and Jews. In the West was large pockets of German areas assigned to them after the First World War. A few other coups, uprisings, and the seizure of the Lithuanian capital, Vilnius, also happened before things calmed down. When Hitler first came to power, Pilsudski, the authoritarian ruler of Poland, suggested crushing the new regime by force while it couldn't defend itself like it did with the Soviet Union. Getting no support for such a move, he and Adolf Hitler, whom admired him, signed a non-aggression pact instead. Since Pilsudski's death in 1935, Poland had been ruled by a hyper-nationalist military junta. Poland's relations with its minority populations, especially the Jews, deteriorated dramatically. The Polish right, whilst anti-Nazi, was also extremely anti-Jewish, and there were frequent clashes between ethnic Poles and ethnic Jews, even up until the German occupation. Poland, like Nazi Germany, would promote Zionism in a hope to get their Jewish population to leave and be done with the ethnic tensions, since no one else in Europe would take the Jews at the time. Britain had now thrown a spanner in the works of Hitler's negotiations with Poland. Hitler's idea was that Poland could be offered concessions in Slovakia in return for Danzig, and a strip of land for a road and rail line to connect the Reich through the Polish corridor. He saw Poland as a potential staunch ally who hated the Soviet Union as much as, if not more than, himself. He wasn't wrong. Poland had jumped in on Germany's carving up of Czechoslovakia not once, but twice. He saw their fates as linked, and he had no quarrels with the Poles. He admired Pilsudski, the previous ruler and hero of Poland, greatly. But now, all that had come to an end. To stop the Germans conquering the world, as some now saw it in London after the fake Romanian and journalist scares, 
Britain had linked her fate with a regime that wasn't that much dissimilar to the Germans, and from that point on, negotiations stopped dead. The regret from London was almost instant. As reality began to set in, and they saw that Germany in fact wasn't just going to go about conquering Europe willy-nilly, as the two scares had suggested, they began to urge the Poles to negotiate. After all, of all the causes so far, was Stanzig not the most logical? Most in London certainly thought so. Hitler's demands weren't viewed as extreme by anyone in London. Even Churchill the arch warmonger got cold feet at times leading up to the war. The Poles could not be budged. They were quite happy to do nothing now they had their guarantee. They wouldn't even talk to the Germans. The more strategic-minded people in Parliament were horrified when Chamberlain presented the news of the guarantee. The idea was that by aligning themselves with Poland, Britain would prevent any kind of German-Polish military or economic deal after having just signed one with Romania. Britain feared she would lose her great power status if Hitler kept up his bloodless victories, gain an ally in Eastern Europe with a large army, and prevent Britain having to get on the path of an alliance with the Soviet Union, which Winston Churchill, ever the fawn in Chamberlain's side, was clamouring for. How on earth was Great Britain, with almost no effective army, meant to protect a nation isolated on the other side of the continent between two militarised superpowers? The answer was, they weren't. But logic wasn't being used at the time. It was in a state of panic. Poor Chamberlain had lost his head. The usually level-headed and fair Chamberlain had let the two other biggest voices, Halifax and Churchill, get to him. Halifax fell to war was the only alternative to prevent Britain becoming a second-rate power in Europe with Germany's growing influence. Churchill, among others, wanted war because that's what his multi-millionaire master, Strakosh, in the city of London, was paying him to do. Britain had given way on Czechoslovakia, the most democratic Eastern European nation at the time, with a defensible border, only to support the unpredictable, aggressive, military junta regime in Poland with wide open frontiers. The guarantee had the exact effect Halifax and Churchill wanted, but not the one Chamberlain wanted. Chamberlain hoped to make Hitler think twice about a two-front war and back down, turning to negotiations instead. Instead, three days after the announcement of the guarantee to Poland, Germany began preparing the way for a potential war. The same way British policy had just done a 180, now so had Germany's. From avoiding war at all costs, war was now on the table. From March to August 1939, to the amazement of the British cabinet, who believed that Danzig should be returned to Germany, the Poles didn't even discuss it with Berlin. All negotiations were rejected. Instead of joining the Nazi crusade against their mutual enemy, the Soviet Union, at the cost of Danzig, a German city, which didn't even matter as they had their own port now, Gdynia, down the coast. They chose to sit on their hands and rely on the British guarantee. As we know from a more recent example, refusing to negotiate with your larger neighbour while having a large minority of their people in your lands is not a good strategy. The insanity in the British government only grew. Whipped up into a frenzy by the press, false reports and paid members of parliament, Chamberlain began dishing out war guarantees like candy, and within just over a month, Holland, Belgium, Switzerland, Romania, Greece, and Turkey were all guaranteed by Great Britain. In April, when most of these were dished out, Britain had two divisions in France ready for combat, and no draft. Lloyd George, the ex-World War I Prime Minister, exploded, saying, Whoever was responsible for these ridiculous guarantees ought to be ousted and sent to a lunatic asylum. Even the Liberian ambassador turned up asking for a guarantee. What on earth was going on? In 1914, the British and French army, with millions of soldiers, barely stopped Germany getting to Paris, how now, with a tiny army, was Britain going to stop Germany marching into Warsaw? Was Hitler supposed to feel that Britain was neutral at this point and not deliberately acting against him? On April 24th, Hitler by this point had had enough, and he cancelled the Anglo-German naval agreement and the non-aggression pact with Poland. In Poland, the message should have been crystal clear. Time to negotiate. Chamberlain got cold feet when he invited Beck to London, and when asked to guarantee Romania alongside Britain, he flatly refused, saying Poles would not be sent to die for the ployest oil fields or for Transylvania. Yet Beck expected Brits to die for Danzig. On April 28th, Hitler publicly put the terms out there that he would find acceptable with Poland. The world over, they were recognised as mild. To summarise, Hitler said he was anxious to reach a peaceful settlement. Poles and Germans had to live side by side, whether they liked it or not, and he would never attempt to refuse the Poles their rightful access to the sea. But Danzig was a German city, and it must be returned. He repeated all the terms he would accept, except not publicly mentioning that he wished to work together with the Poles against the Soviets in the future. Beck stood up in the Polish Diet, their parliament, and rejected Hitler's offers. From now on, no one talked. They kept up the tactic of simply ignoring Berlin. The British ambassador to Germany begged Chamberlain to reconsider and back out before it was too late. He never knew the German terms were so mild. He thought there could be no peace until Danzig was handed over and that it was a just cause. Still, the British refused to push Beck to negotiate, Understandably, Hitler assumed it was the Brits behind Poland's refusal to talk. Britain took things further still. A six-month courting of Stalin ensued, led by Churchill, 
The only army that could realistically stop Germany smashing Poland, if they so wished, was the Red Army. Stalin, as terms of his alliance, demanded that the Baltic states be made protectorates and that he could march into Romania and Poland to meet the German army. The issue here was that Romania and Poland feared Stalin far more than they feared Hitler. They knew what Red Army troops in their territory meant, as all of Eastern Europe was to find out later. Stalin also wanted a more fair request that if Hitler attacked the Soviet Union, Britain would join the war on the Soviet side. In the end, the British negotiations went nowhere. The Germans took the initiative and made their own pact with Stalin. There was never any competition. This is known now to history as the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Britain had brought the Soviets into the game, and now Poland's fate was sealed for the next 50 years. If it came to war, Stalin would get one half of Poland, Hitler the other. Stalin drove a hard bargain. He repeated his demand for the Baltic states, and with a heavy heart, Hitler accepted. Hitler had a soft spot for the Baltic people. He knew that he would be back later anyway, and he was right. The tiny country of Latvia would have more SS recruits than any other nation by a huge margin just a few years later to fight alongside Hitler against Stalin. If they'd known that Hitler had just signed their country away to Stalin previously, I think most would have had second thoughts. A week before the war, the British were terrified of the reality they had brought on. They begged Beck to negotiate. They asked the Poles to send a representative to Berlin to negotiate immediately. No, was the answer. Hitler was desperately searching for a way out also. He'd reluctantly secured an understanding with Stalin to stop the Brits doing so first, but the last thing he wanted was a war with Britain. He'd wrote in Mein Kampf and spoken endlessly about how the British were his dream alliance. Hitler had nothing to gain in the West and didn't care for war with France or Britain. He'd even let Italy keep South Tyrol. He'd completely written off any German demands in the West. Goering also was up attempting to secure some kind of alternate arrangement. These two especially didn't want war with Britain. On the 30th of August, Hitler sent his most benevolent peace offer yet. Return Danzig, but the Poles can keep the economic rights in the city and for plebiscites to be held in the corridor to decide its future. The Poles said no. Some suggest this peace offer was actually a Nazi ploy to offer Britain an escape hatch. It seems likely this was the case. How could such an offer be turned down? After all, half of the territorial questions in Europe have been settled by plebiscite anyway, after the Great War. In the final days leading up to war, the British adopted a fatalistic attitude about what was to come. They knew they'd made a mistake, but gave up trying to stop the inevitable bloodbath that was to come. Up until the last minute, Hitler believed the British war guarantee was most likely a bluff, so he proceeded. After all, Britain wasn't known as perfidious Albion on the continent for no reason. They were known all over the world for not following up with their agreements and screwing people over. This time, that wasn't the case. Hitler had no way of backing out. His prestige would be in ruins, and ethnic Germans were being massacred by the thousands in Polish lands due to a jingoistic press hopping up the Polish population for war with the support of the Polish government. Hitler can be accused and convicted of many things, but not caring about Germans isn't one of them. He was going crazy with rage as these reports of these atrocities kept coming in. He couldn't believe the British had partnered themselves with such a people. Still, he couldn't bring himself to fight the British. In the event the British followed through, the French frontier was not to be crossed, he said, and that also went for engaging the British and French at sea or in the air. From this speech, the phony war was born. And if Churchill had never suggested the invasion of Norway in 1940, peace probably would have followed eventually. That's a story I've already covered, though. Eventually, Hitler could wait no longer. He was receiving more and more reports of ethnic Germans being killed. The real numbers are horrifying enough, but it turned out Hitler's numbers he was getting were inflated, in some cases, ten times as many. To guess how angry he was requires no imagination. On the 1st of September, the war began. The Polish defences were gone by the 2nd. The Poles were begging the British to declare war and help. What kind of help they could realistically have given would be a good question, but no one appeared to be thinking logically at the time. Chamberlain appeared to be looking to weasel his way out of the deal. It would have cost him his career, but it would have saved tens of millions of lives. He spoke in Parliament hoping that Hitler would sit down for a conference and the situation could still be saved. Not the worst idea. Maybe the reality of the German invasion would knock some reality into the Poles. Unfortunately for the millions to die in the war that was about to become a world war when Britain entered the picture, Chamberlain was told that if he did not declare war, the warmongers in Parliament would rise in revolt and oust him, which ended up happening a year later anyway. The next day, Britain declared war. Chamberlain looked like he'd aged overnight, a broken man. Seven weeks later, Chamberlain would write his sister, I was never meant to be a war leader. When Germany invaded, not a single bomb, not a single bullet, and not a single pound had been sent to Poland before the war to help. The Poles had been promised bombing raids on Germany when the war broke out. None came. Instead, within hours of war breaking out, leaflets were dropped on Germany via those same bombers, while half-hearted attacks were carried out with real bombs at naval targets in the North Sea. The French had promised the Poles that the bulk of the French army would immediately march east into Germany when war broke out. 
no major offensive ever came. The Poles, as they should have realised all along, were on their own. They were chips used by the great powers to bluff Hitler, and the bluff had been called. That promised offensive in the West did not come for another five years, this time in the form of mostly American troops. Although Germany is to blame for the war, Britain is solely to blame for making it a world war. The Germans could have solved the Polish question alone like they did anyway. There was never a realistic prospect of Germany backing out once those massacres of ethnic Germans had begun. They would have to cede Danzig and measures would have to be put in place for the safety of the remaining Germans in Poland. All the British getting involved had done, although inadvertently, was to bring the Soviet Union out of its isolation, condemn tens of millions to die and condemn tens of millions to Soviet rule in Eastern Europe anyway, the very land they had promised to protect. The thanks they got was the looting of their own empire by their supposed allies, the Americans. Britain ceased to be a great power the second it entered this unwinnable war.